Knowledge is power. And this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll-free. Toll-free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the hosts. Here is Michael McAuliffe and Jen Solis. Good afternoon. This is Michael McAuliffe, and welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Jen Solis is out today, but here at my side, I have William Baker, known affectionately in the community as Beach. Uh, he'll be sitting in for Jen. Uh, Beach is the Director of Legislative Volunteers and Unions uh, Participation for Weekend. So uh, he's been working on this issue for a long time with us. Um, so, Beach, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Outstanding. Well, let's get right into it. We were talking as we, uh, uh, as we were doing the run-up for the show here of a couple of uh, articles from the Las Vegas Review Journal, both uh, posted on March 26th. And uh, first, let's go to an editorial from the Las Vegas Review Journal where they say medical marijuana still makes most local elected officials nervous despite ample political cover from voters and lawmakers alike. It's been more than a decade since the electorate amended the state constitution to allow the sick to use doctor-recommended cannabis, and it's been almost a year since the legislature finally allowed the licensing of of up to 40 dispensaries in southern Nevada. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yet local governments, no hallelujah, have still been reluctant to allow businesses that are thriving and providing significant tax revenues in other states to open up here. Uh, It's... Absolutely. Um, you know, there, there are a handful of, of ill-advised restrictions that will only serve to make the medical cannabis more expensive and harder to come by for patients who need it. One of those is a requirement that dispensaries sell products cultivated in the county, and that creates a big regulatory burden on entrepreneurs from the get-go. And, and moving away from the editorial for a moment, it's really uh, a difficult uh, thing to, to stomach. Uh, we're here uh, as Nevadans, and we're working on this state program uh, for all these years. And now we have the county commission voting by four to two to throw the other counties by the wayside. And we certainly hear a lot about the rivalry uh, between upstate and downstate and uh, more people in downstate, yet money's going upstate and the, the capital is up there and all. But... Yes, we're citizens of Clark County, but we're also citizens of Nevada. And this protectionism for the county uh, means that in the other counties, they're not going to have, with the exception of Washoe, uh, enough population to really support commercial cultivation and the dispensary that goes along with it. And it, it seems to be a real problem that will wind up costing the taxpayers more money because in talking with the, tick spo- the bill sponsor, Tick Sagerblom, and other attorneys, none of them think that this will, will stand a court challenge. And it's just a, a method of getting some licenses granted in Clark County, grandfathering them in, and shutting out the other counties. Hmm. Boy, that's really interesting. I'm not too real happy with the city. I was at their city meeting last uh, Wednesday, which uh, is actually going on right now again. And uh, I thought the uh, the whole thing should have been scrapped. But I got up and I, I told them that some of these things were anti-business and anti-patient and and rather disgusting. Uh, the county uh, is w- six to eight months ahead of the uh, city. The state is uh, just last Friday okayed their regulations, and the uh, county's all together. So basically, we're building a model for the state. We don't want to be like California. We don't want a, every city, every jurisdiction to be completely different. We want the uh, the state to be one model, and hopefully one model for the nation someday. Uh, so uh, we need a unified system. The city needs to get on board and start following the county and the state model. And um, I hope the patients and the business people will stand up and, and uh, yep about that to the city and send them emails and uh, show up to the meetings and 
and uh, let's run this ball from here to heaven. Absolutely true. You know, uh, go, getting back to this editorial, they, they talk about the fact that um, uh, Commission Chair Steve Sisolak uh, said that one co- company's estimates were that a single cultivation facility will create 200 jobs. Now, <laughs> you know, myself and other, other <laughs> activists have, have kind of scratched our heads and looked at each other over that. You know, I can, I can imagine if somebody had a, a farm with 40 acres up in Northern California that once a year during harvest time, they might need to bring in 100 plus trimmers if, if they've got a huge volume. But the idea that these facilities are going to employ that many mm-hmm. people, I, I think, is just a pipe dream. Well, if they were in a constant state of harvest then okay. And considering the demand in Colorado and Washington State right now, I'd say they need to be in a constant state of harvest. But uh, that's really rather foolish because it takes a long time to put in a crop from seed to to harvest. And and generally, you don't need all that much help during the beginning stages of of planting. I I think what it's going to wind up being is is almost a, a seasonal uh, sort of effort, and it depends on these individual facilities how mm. often they are going to be harvesting. They might have their plants set up to right. be harvesting every week, in which case mm. they'll have more people trimming and, sure. and more jobs in the industry there. But uh, if they're if they've got these big rooms and they're only harvesting once a month or, or once every couple of weeks for for several days, they're going to wind up using uh, part time contract labor. And I know mm. the the union is trying to get in there, and there are some uh, private educational concerns that are trying to supply people for that when that day comes. Uh, but 200 jobs sounds like an awful lot. And, and so with that, though, I can understand the idea that if you've got 200 jobs and, and you've got 10 facilities, you know, that's 2,000 jobs that the county could use. But um, we really are citizens of the state of Nevada, mm-hmm. and we need to look out for the rest of the state as well and, and the people in those areas who don't have the tourist income that we do mm-hmm. in Clark County. Yeah, some of the interesting things I found, we're not just talking medicine, we're also talking agriculture here. And I can't imagine telling a championship rose producer that they can only produce so much and they can only do certain things during certain times of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to all be indoors and hidden. and, And I mean, some of these rules are just really rather ridiculous. And they're really strapping the business. They're really uh, hindering the access for patients. More so what we're seeing from the from the city uh, so far right. than the county. And um, well, I think the county is doing wonderful. Yes, I they're doing great. the county's doing terrific. Uh, it was pointed out to me after the, the meeting last uh, Wednesday was that the, the city ordinance runs 38 pages long, and it has a lot of just garbage in it. And the county ordinance is only six pages long. And yeah. the county has a, a beautiful streamlined program that's really well thought out. And the, the fear that I have of the city program is they're not, they're saying, okay, well, we're not going to do a moratorium. We're not going to ban these places. We're going to allow them to happen. But they're making their rules so onerous uh, as to preclude anyone from setting up shop within the city boundaries. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, they're saying, well, we'd, we'd like that tax revenue. But on the other hand, they're saying, but we really don't want your business here, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And the funny thing is, in Las Vegas, the townships are sort of surrounded by the city. So it's kind of hard to tell if you're in a township or part of the county, or you're actually in the city, and you could be a couple blocks away and have a wonderful, gigantic mega store, dispensary, cultivation center in the township, and two blocks away be in the city and just couldn't even have a bomb and pop operation because the city is just going to drown you with all these regulations. And sadly, I don't see any of those mom and pop operations happening anyway. No. From from what I'm hearing, and I'm I'm getting a lot of calls. I hear a lot about this. It it looks as if this uh, industry is going to be concentrated into a few very wealthy hands. Uh, partnerships that are putting together uh, between fifteen thirty five million dollars uh, and and shutting out the the middle class people who were uh, some of the the fiercest supporters of this reform through the uh, last legislative cycle and through the election cycle in 2012. So uh, the 
bill has not translated into really what the people want, and that's unfortunate, but it happens all too often in this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's move on to the, the next article uh, from the RJ, which says, the proposed medical marijuana rules criticized in Las Vegas. And uh, you mentioned this a little earlier, Beach, that uh, last Wednesday, the Las Vegas business licensing staff uh, had a meeting in which they, um, which they had their proposed regulations unveiled. And a couple of weeks before that, or I, I was at the city council and during the testimony on moving forward, and I said, you guys really need to move this into a bigger room than you're planning on it. You're going to have more people, and it should be like in, in the city council chambers here would be a great place for it. And they decided, no, no, this room we have is fine. And, and so last Wednesday, there were 100 people packed into the room. There was a fire marshal at the door. And then uh, what wound up happening was there were 100 more people who would not get let in. And even the uh, the assistant to Jackie Holloway, uh, who's the director of business licensing, Matt Walker, was not let into the room by the uh, the fire marshals because the room was full. And here's a guy who's working for the county, working on these programs, and he gets turned away. It was a, it was a completely inadequate uh, setting for this. And fortunately, uh, they heard uh, common sense. And the meeting that is going on right now, as we speak, uh, is being held in the city hall. And and so hopefully there is uh, enough room for everybody, and, and I'm sure it will. The, the council chambers are, are, are large enough. But some of what happened uh, at, or, or what the city unveiled last week uh, really, as the uh, article says, drew the ire of some of the hundred who attended uh, this city meeting. Uh, for example, they're not allowing dispensary owners to refer patients to physicians. They're requiring three security guards at all times. Uh, they're, they're keeping cultivation facilities separate from the dispensaries, meaning that there's either going to be no vertical in- integration of one company owning both, or they're just increasing transport costs, security costs mm-hmm. by having to go from one location to another. And it, it just makes the entire business more costly for business and therefore more costly for the patients. There was one wild-eyed activist there named William Baker uh, who said, you should remove this entire page where it reads prohibited activities. Uh, you know, apparently, Beach, you thought the dress code scenario was silly uh, because one of the things that the city is saying is that people who go into these dispensaries cannot wear uh, sunglasses or hats. And m- <laughs> meanwhile, people who have glaucoma uh, will wear sunglasses all the time when, when they're yeah. not in a dimly lit room. So uh, these regulations are, are just um, way over the top. Once again, uh, as I've been saying for several months, these regulators, these city people are treating this as if or plutonium, not mm-hmm. pot. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And here you have this, this building, which has a thir- uh, this meeting rather, which has a, a 38 page draft and they wanted public comments on and the meeting only lasted 40 minutes yeah that's that's just too that's bureaucracy for you folks and uh we can do something about it in 2016 we plan on changing some more of these laws and we're not going to let them get away with uh, cutting out the little people and the people who have supported us all along the way so you need to go and join we can and we can 702.org join us become a part of us help us fight this fight Yes, absolutely. We can't do it alone. We have been doing it so far, and we've made progress, but together we can do it, and together we can win this fight. So, you know, during this meeting, uh, you had an owner uh, named Miles Kinn, who owns uh, four dispensaries in San Bernardino and is looking to open one here. He said, what will you do to protect us from the federal government? And William Horn, uh, Nevada's Assembly Majority Leader, was also at the meeting, and he said that as long as these businesses will comport with the coal memo, which was uh, released by the Department of Justice last year, uh, it made it clear that enforcement of these is not a priority as long as you stay away from eight specific areas, which include diversion to non-patients, to kids, no no gangs or, or affiliations uh, of that. So, you know, as long as that coal memo is followed, it, it should be a fairly safe industry. And we're going to talk more about that with our guest uh, in the next couple of minutes. And, and I'd like to bring on now uh, Mark 
Terbeek, uh, you know, this afternoon. Let's welcome Mark Terbeek to the show. He's been closely involved in the development of the new medical cannabis establishment regulations with both the state and the county. Mark has assisted in the development of several state programs and has also helped to obtain licenses for applicants in different space, states. So he can speak with authority on this subject. So welcome to the show, Mark. Good afternoon, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you for having me aboard. Welcome, Mark. My my pleasure. I, I, you know, we we are all here about uh, spreading the word and spreading news and, and giving good information. So um, I I know that you're a terrific source of that information. Did you uh, did you happen to hear that uh, just just before airtime we we heard uh, that the president uh, just this afternoon uh, rescheduled cannabis and completely took it off the Controlled Substances Act. I, I missed that one. I must have been I must have been too busy eating lunch uh, to to have uh, ca- caught that one. Wow, that's great news. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's great news. You realize what day today is, of course. Uh, April Fool's. Oh no! Well, no <laughs> fooling. It is April first, and and while that last piece of information may have been been a bit over the top, uh, in fact, the new medical cannabis law in Nevada takes effect today. Uh, patients are able to uh, to now possess two and a half ounces rather than the one ounce default, and rather than the seven plant limit that they previously had, uh, the patients are now allowed to have twelve plants uh, per patient uh, in whatever state of maturity. So. Uh, uh, there, there is some progress, and uh, the the various aspects of the the newly reformatted 453A do come into play today, and uh, so we we wanted to make sure that people know that. No fooling. No fooling. So, Mark, as we get started, could you describe your practice for us? What kind of law do you practice? Well, I I have what I would call a multidisciplinary practice that has a, uh, a sub focus on cannabis business law. Okay. Uh, what, what type of, uh, when you say multidisciplinary, what, um, what kind of areas uh, are, are you working in? Well, my, uh, my firm uh, has a workers' compensation and injury law component, uh, a real estate component, um, a general business law component, a litigation component. Uh, I have uh, been involved in disputes concerning contracts, insurance, zoning, it, it runs a, a large um, gamut, if you will, of areas that pertain, in fact, to cannabis business law. So you're, you've been, uh, you're, you're very well-rounded. How long have you been practicing? 21 years. That's, that's a while. That, that's, that's even longer than I've been working in this movement. <laughs> so how did, how did you wind up getting into this area of specialization, though, working within the cannabis industry? Well, it was interesting. In, in 2008... Prior to 2008, there was a real concern for uh, legal professionals to get into advising entities on the operational aspects of a medical cannabis dispensary, uh, particularly in California and pretty much elsewhere, because um, of legal concerns. Let's just say that. And then this decision came out in 2008 called Qualified Patients versus the City of Anaheim, which, um, in effect, in my view, and I think a lot of other lawyers view because the the field really exploded after that, gave a reasoned basis for lawyers to do so in discharge of their duties of zealous advocacy and representation because instead of then being seen as uh, assisting in the transacting of cannabis, the legal advice was how to comply with state law governing the transacting of cannabis. Okay. so And then from there on in, I, I, I... uh, worked with, uh, I'd known uh, a fellow by the name of Dan Rush, who uh, is with the United Food and Commercial Workers. In fact, he's currently the director of the Cannabis Workers Rising Campaign for the United Food and Commercial Workers. He and I began working together, or had been working together, on um, issues of import to unrepresented and underrepresented communities. Uh, I was, I'm general counsel for the Instituto Laboral de la Raza, for which he is a treasurer, and I have been a supporter of that organization for 10 years now. And the uh, city of Oakland began announcing that it was going to revamp its entire process concerning medical cannabis to have a detailed ordinance with a application process, a transparent merit-based application process, not just for dispensaries, but for cultivation facilities as well. And uh, Dan asked me to work uh, with him to help frame 
that process, and, and I did, and we got some good stuff into Oakland's uh, permitting process uh, that we've carried uh, to other localities and states. Outstanding. All right. Well, we're going to be right back. We need to take a break here, but then we're going to get into specifics of, of the Nevada cannabis uh, movement. And so stay with us, Mark, and uh, please stay with us, listenership. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Hi, welcome back. I'm Beach, and I, we're doing a 420 moment. And today we're going to honor Jen Solis, our president and founder who is sick out today. Normally we can't say uh, too much nice about her when she's on the air. You understand that. But Jen, she started this group about six years ago. And uh, we first started out as a, ac a patient access group. We didn't know what to call ourselves. We thought about affiliating with Normo and a lot of different groups. And uh, Americans for Safe Access and, and uh, Nevada Policy Project. And we tried them all. Yep. But uh, we stayed with it and Jen stayed with it. And so we salute Jen today with our 420 moment. Pray for her that she'll feel better and she'll be behind this microphone next week. I'm sure she will. All right, let's get back to this interview with Mark Turbeek, uh, our cannabis specialist from Oakland, California. So, Mark, you and I have been in a number of small closed-door meetings in the development of these regulations. How would you compare the way Nevada is moving in this area as compared with the other states you've been involved with? Very similar from the state uh, uh, level aspect of it. Um, Entities, public entities, whether it be state, county, or cities that don't have experience with this uh, generally want to look to sources with the experience uh, of this. So they look to municipal sources that will work with them. They'll look to, uh, to private consultants who have credibility uh, and background and, and are believed to be honest uh, players. Uh, so this is nothing particularly unusual with the way the state is moving forward. So then, as we're uh, we're being included in these uh, meetings uh, between advocacy groups such as we can, uh, private attorneys such as yourself, so you're saying that that's a fairly standard way to move forward in this because we've had an awfully hard time getting in the door on this one. <laughs> really? You mean in Nevada? Yes. Um, well, indeed, and for some reason, uh, Nevada was a little slow to come to that, but uh, since uh, we've been working the other, um, and I've been working in coalition with the United Food and Commercial Workers, and we can, uh, it seems that uh, they've at least given us some sort of ear uh, as to our interests. Yeah, I'd, I'd say we have certainly come a long way in this issue. I started testifying before the legislature back in 2009 on this issue, and at that time, nobody really wanted to talk to me. They they just they would give me my three minutes, uh, have no questions, and you know, okay, next, and and couldn't couldn't be done with me quick enough. Uh, and now, of course, they're uh, giving us uh, uh, more time, uh, bringing us uh, into public meetings, and taking part in the the weekend uh, uh, Nevada Medical Cannabis Symposium. 
symposium series, uh, and and it all confers a, a terrific legitimacy on us, and at the same time shows that they're uh, making a good faith effort to uh, to listen to a constituency and and move forward for the best of all involved. So through this uh, development process, we keep hearing how there are going to be delays uh, and longer rollout time frames. Yet the process seems to me, at least, to be moving forward ahead of schedule at each step. Um, the originally the state was not going to have its uh, regulations available until June, and here they were by the end of March. Uh, the county was not going to have stuff available until midsummer, and then they they uh, waived a, a comment period and they, they moved it forward. Um, do you th- agree that it's moving uh, more quickly? And, and if so, why do you think it's unfolding this way? That's interesting. It is moving uh, more quickly than uh, was publicized uh, earlier. I think there's a couple of things that, that educate that, uh, or that educate us about that. One is the game-changing nature of the coal memo uh, that uh, turned, I think, turned a real corner as far as public entities um, and states, um, their vision as to how to address and deal with the issue of medical cannabis or cannabis in general. and then they saw from that a sort of tidal wave of opportunity, tax opportunity, and other opportunity coming. And they wanted then to work with uh, credible, uh, good faith, honest brokers that that had been approaching them previously in the process. So it was a little late, but better late than ever as far as as the state of Nevada goes and some other states. Um, But the interesting thing is the divergence between the uh, local level and local levels, differing local levels in the state. I think the state was able to come up with its regulations and publicize its its final regulations uh, in a pretty good format and form because of the input that we have had. And when I say we, I'm talking three particularly significant players, which was WECAN, the United Food and Commercial Workers, and frankly, uh, their decision and capacity to work in coalition with attorneys such as myself and other consultants uh, Mm -hmm. such as myself uh, and Rebecca Mm Gaska, who uh, had done some uh, lobbying on behalf of the bill. So with all the input that they received from these sources, uh, they were able to get ahead maybe sooner than they thought they were going to get ahead. As far as the the county and and the city, the county's decision or process, if you will, the way that it is going forward and the speed with which it is going forward uh, is difficult to understand under the current context. I think they're moving a little ahead of the state in in a way that uh, does not necessarily make sense from a transparency standpoint. Hmm. Okay, we're, and we'll get into that in, in just a minute. But as as far as the, the business aspects, um, who or what kind of applicant groups do you think will have the best shot at getting licenses? Well, this, keep in mind, the state statute uh, was written with a certain bias toward uh, organizations or groups that demonstrated a significant financial contribution to the state of Nevada. Therefore, business organizations that had large tax payrolls, uh, large pay payouts to the state of Nevada's coffers, uh, directly and indirectly, those are going to be larger entities. They will have uh, necessarily, statutorily, a sort of advantage. Uh, another advantage toward a, a larger, more well-funded group is the nature of the regulations themselves, keeping in mind that cannabis is a medicine and a product that, although not plutonium for sure, uh, is still intended for human consumption. There are a lot of regulations and a lot of basically business burdens that one has to meet in creating, say, uh, a facility to grow the raw uh, vegetable leaf uh, that uh, provides the basis for the dispensed final product or the edibles or infused uh, at the production facilities. And these are all expensive things to to do. So the best groups are the ones that are going to be very well funded uh, and have uh, experience 
and a, and a vision that shows up in its organizational structure uh, and its bank accounts. And that is assuming a level playing field, a transparent merit-based process. Mm -hmm. Well, so then do you think that middle-class Nevadans and and entrepreneurs uh, from Nevada or beyond will have a shot at some of these licenses? Or do you think that all of those licenses will wind up going to a small group of of wealthy and connected investors? Well, my, uh, my fear is that they would probably go to a small group of wealthy, connected, emphasis on the connected investors, uh, a, a middle class, financially, uh, a middle class investor or entrepreneur might have a shot uh, or might have had a shot at something like a, a dispensary, uh, and then the regulations at the last minute uh, imposed a 2,500 square foot minimum on the dispensary. Uh, so, you know, you can do it. And you're still going to need uh, 250, 300, 350, maybe more thousand dollars to open up just minimally uh, a dispensary at 2,500 square feet. That would be in the reach, I think, uh, of a middle class person with access to loan capital. Uh, but a production facility with everything that's required to, to implement with respect to a production facility and a cultivation facility, those may be out of reach from ordinary middle-class Nevadans, as I understand the term middle-class. I, I don't disagree. Uh, that is a direction that I see this going in, uh, unfortunately, uh, because, in fact, in 2012, uh, it was the middle-class Nevadans who, at the uh, the county level, were telling the the party platform committees that they wanted this to move forward and that they wanted to have uh, dispensaries, better access for patients, and they wanted your middle-class Nevadan to take part in this new green rush that is going to generate a tremendous amount of wealth. And and their feeling was, the rich people, they've already got that money. Give the rest of us a, a chance to, to go at it. And it's it's a shame to see that it's, uh, it, it's not really moving in that direction. Right. That's our next battle. Yeah. So do you think this is just because do you, do you think that this is more a case of absolute needs and nece- necessity or is this just politics as usual because after all if someone let's say they were get, going to do a cultivation facility and they start out small and then they can bootstrap themselves up after several harvests to to move into a uh, or to increase the size of their of their space within a facility uh, that they're actually using to cultivate and that would seem to be a sustainable growth model that would also take into account the fact that um, that the patient base itself is still only about 5,000 people in the state but is expected to move to 50,000 within a year. So the idea that you're going to have these big 20, 50,000, 70,000 square foot facilities, which are, are cultivation facilities, they're going to overproduce at the start. And uh, it would seem that a, a, a smaller entrepreneur would actually be more uh, in line with what the state is looking to do. Well, that's the interesting thing about it, because, in fact, uh, again, if it was, everything was level and even, Stephen, and transparent merit-based, you would have uh, a continuum of small cultivators versus very large cultivators, and the risk on that one is that the large cultivators would overproduce, the price would bottom out, and uh, the small cultivator would find it economically untenable to market his wares in that atmosphere. Uh, so, I mean, market forces, they're, they're a funny thing. And uh, I think there is room, theoretically, for uh, a business model on cultivation, as you noted. Mm-hmm. And let's not forget the reciprocity concept. There may be five to 50,000 uh, Nevadans now and in the next several years that uh, will avail themselves of a medical cannabis but there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands uh, every year of -of out-of-state people subject to the reciprocity provisions of the law that will also uh, want to make themselves, uh, want to make available access to medical cannabis in the state of Nevada during their visits. Absolutely. But you you raise a good question. The whole politics as usual, I mean, here's a... um, a reality of the entire 
American, probably even Western Anglo economic political system. It's all about the money. It's been, it didn't used to be that way. When I graduated high school in 1979, it was, it was not, not that way so much. But now it's, everything is bought and sold on, uh, on the political level. Mm. Uh, and everything, every law, every aspect of every law, all the regulations that are put out there tend to favor wealthier corporatized interests over individual interests. Are you talking about uh, some of the fallout of uh, rulings like Citizens United then? Specific, yeah, specifically Citizens United was the, the floodgates of it all. Even before then, it was uh, pretty ugly for the eight or ten years before Citizens United. But since Citizens United, uh, there are no rules. There are, there are no limits. And so laws are now uh, produced and framed by uh, entities like ALEC, uh, the Legislative mm-hmm. Exchange, American Leg- Legislative Exchange Council, that they, they prepare these laws that are anti-consumer and pro-corporate, they, they are introduced without change, literally sometimes with weird typos in them, without change in state legislatures, voted on and frequently approved. That's the political system we live in, and an ordinary individual has no access to that political system. And in fact, Congress, uh, the makeup of Congress this session has the largest percentage of millionaires in the history of of Congress, so right. they're not truly the people's house anymore. Right. And truly just, not, and, and yeah. as a corollary to that, uh, at no time in history have the interests, the stated interests of the vast majority of people been as roundly ignored, and the hidden interests of the 1% and less been so steadfastly adhered to as in the current Congress. I, I agree completely with that. Yes. So, but getting back, getting back to Nevada and, and something that, that maybe we have a little bit of control over, um, on, on the state level here, we have this, uh, you know, a definite merit-based system, which, um, which certainly uh, we worked on together to, to help get through the legislature. Uh, but on various local levels, however, there seemed to be a trend towards these special use permits. And not only down here in Clark, uh, we're seeing it happen out in Nye, where I'm hearing it happening up in Story County. Uh, and these these use permits are going to be awarded by elected officials rather than through the standard business licensing uh, practices. Now, we've talked about transparency and, and merit-based, so how concerned are you about this development? I'm greatly concerned. My, uh, my deep concern is that um, local officials um, with access to a lot of this money may feel that they can uh, get around the federal tracking that is most certainly going on with respect to that. They can hide it. They can have bag men take uh, the money here or deposit it there, and they can feel that they can be clean as a whistle on it, give favors that are bought and paid for to their friends uh, without having to address the merit-based process and sidestep it. So they'll, uh, for example, they'll front-run the merit-based process. So the special use permits are granted before the merit-based process is gone through at the state level. And the, and the uh, approach on that one is, well, if you don't get the special use permit, you're not going to apply for the state level, and therefore there's not going to be any scrutiny, any potential for revealing a discrepancy in the ranking process between the state level and the ones that are given out pursuant to the special use permit. I'm greatly concerned about that and what that, uh, and what that means for the consumers of the state, not to mention what it means if the feds, uh, which I expect them to do, will investigate that, it might discredit the entire movement in the state. Well, on, on two points there, I mean, here in Clark County, Nevada, we are we're very familiar with uh, this corruption angle. About 10 years ago, uh, the feds uh, did something called Operation G-Sting, uh, which wound up having four out of the seven county commissioners uh, doing time in a, in a federal prison. And so I, I would have to think that the current crop of commissioners is acutely aware of that kind of scrutiny, and I, I have not spoken with all of them on this but uh, several that I have they're they're very mindful of this and and they're understanding that that the federal government is casting a very 
close and cautious eye on on what's happening here and and that's not to say that that shenanigans won't happen anyway but um i i think that that there is some uh, uh circumspection on this issue uh by some of these sitting commissioners because none of them wants to wind up where their where their compatriots were however if you look at like the state of illinois where where five out of the last eight governors have gone to prison after their terms you know <laughs> some people just don't learn <laughs> some so. people exactly some people don't just learn and like I say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to name the, the people that I think are above board, and I do believe that there are some of the commissioners that are above board on this one and have confidence in versus the ones I don't. Mm-hmm. I think, I think uh, what, what is the problem here is a potential uh, arrogance and hubris is that it happened to the other fella, and it's not going to happen to me, and it's just they're not realizing that even as we speak, Their bank accounts are being monitored by the FBI and the Department of Justice because the National Security Agency has access to all of that, is scooping up all of that, and it's sharing information on a daily basis with these other agencies. So if there's money been exchanged, they already know it, and they're just going to wait to see how that plays out. And if it looks uh, like it doesn't pass the smell test, you can get a registration if if you're a, a an interest or a group that wants to play it that way, but it doesn't do you much good when you spend all that money and 18 months later it's all shut down because, you know, half the people involved are indicted. Hmm. Well, we're going to ask one more question here and go to a break. And, and what that is, is given that this industry is coming forth for the benefit of patients, what can patients, their caregivers, advocates, activists do to ensure a fair merit-based system for awarding these licenses and make sure that that, that system prevails? Make a stink at all uh, county commission meetings, at the city councils that are dealing with this, and at the state level. And any time there's a hearing on it, get up there, go forward, and say, we want a transparent merit-based system. And we want you to make sure that any applicant, any license, passes through and is vetted by this transparent merit-based system, because that's the way that gives the best medicine uh, at the best price uh, to the people who need it. Absolutely. And without those people, without those patients, we wouldn't even have an industry here. So we're going to take a break now, and then we're going to come back uh, for more with Mark Turbeek. Come out and join us April 4th for Nevada Medical Cannabis Symposium 4, NCMS4. That's April 4th at Main Street Station. Look on our website, www.wecan702.org or www.wecan702.com for details. This symposium is going to help you with your final draft regulations and also to get any people that you may need for your application. So make sure to join us on April 4th at the Main Street Station in the Roundhouse. You can find information at www.wecan702.org. Go to the top of the page and click on Symposium. That will take you to a direct link to register. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Did you know that over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications? Yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119. 702-388-1119 or visit us online at getmedicalmarijuananow.com. Thank you.
And we're back with Mark Trebek. And Mark, I'm going to ask you to hold on for just a minute because we have uh, Ariel Clark calling in from the city meeting uh, to give us an update on what went on today. Ariel, Hello, welcome to the show. Welcome. Hello, Michael. Thank you very much. So what's going on down at the city there? Are they still, do they have their crazy hats on? Well, not much to report from today. This was the second day where the city accepted public comment regarding the proposed regulations. Um, Karen Duddleson, who is the director of business licensing, uh, she mediated the program. And I would say the entire city council chambers were completely full of folks who were giving individual comment regarding the draft 38 pages of ordinance. Good. Wow, that's that's a lot of people. That's a fair-sized hall. Good. It, yeah, it was great. I would say a lot of the comments um, kind of discussed the rather onerous nature of many of um, the sections in the ordinance, but I would also say please do go to the City of Las Vegas uh, website and look at the draft regulations. I'll be accepting written comment until uh, April 24th at 5 p.m., and they were very receptive to listening to people's feedback. So um, similar to what we saw at, at, with Clark County, the city of Las Vegas is very open to um, comment. Um, and also just as, as a side note, on April 22nd from 6 to 8, there will be a city um, town hall meeting. Very good. Uh, is, that, is the meeting still going on at this point or is it over now? Um, it was pretty much wrapping up by the time I stepped out. So, in other words, they had uh, city hall, um, uh, the county, the city council chambers, which, to my mind, have at least a couple of hundred seats, mm-hmm. if if not more. It were full of people who wanted to make comments, and they had um, an hour and and some an hour and some small change to make these in Mm -hmm. so they probably gave everybody about 15 seconds to talk right (laughs) yes good Uh, and we want to thank everyone that showed up and is listening on radio right now absolutely absolutely we do so uh they they have not said anything about some of their uh ideas like um uh forcing people uh, not to wear uh hats or sunglasses (laughs) or or limiting They're, they're just they're just in a period of taking public comment and not giving any feedback Yes, indeed. But I will say it was more than 15 seconds. They allowed some individuals to speak for several minutes about personal stories as well as kind of substantive comment. Um, But, you know, with regard to any feedback from their end, um, just taking comment until April 24th. All right. Well, thank you so much for that report, Ariel. Uh, Ariel was on our show a couple of weeks ago, along with uh, Victoria Seaman and Michelle Fiore, and uh, she will be speaking at the Nevada Medical Cannabis Symposium on Friday. And, you know, do yourself a favor if you're interested in this industry. Get out there and and, and get to that symposium. You'll get a lot of great uh, material and a lot of knowledge from people like Ariel and Mark. So thanks so much for calling in, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Bye now. Mark, you still there with us? I am. Outstanding. So we see that the, or we hear that the the city of Las Vegas was just taking some public comment without, um, uh, without, saying anything about the the merits of of their program or uh, regulations or uh, or anything else. So if we look at these regulatory levels individually, um, I, I know that you've been poring over all of these things and going line by line on and we talked about that last night. Um, what do you think of the final release of the state regulations? I think they're I, I think they're good in that they provide a transparent merit based process to evaluate applicants. Uh, I think they're very comprehensive and they address things that need to be addressed in the preparation of these products, uh, for example. And, and this is what I like. They are treating uh, production facilities as any other food production facility uh, because you're producing uh, items, edible items that people eat. Um, so there are a number of issues that are specific to cannabis. Those issues are reflected in the regulations. Uh, I could fly spec some of the issues about this or that. Uh, some of it uh, might seem a little burdensome. Um, when one is looking at it um, out of context. Mm -hmm. Uh, But overall, uh, I tend to believe that the current or the final state of the regulations serve the interests of the industry and the consumers of medical cannabis well. 
So if you're saying that, that they're treating this like any other food product, would that fall under a bailiwick of, let's say, um, equal protection under the law, that they're not <laughs> singling this out uh, among all substances? Uh, singling it out in what way? Well, the, for um, overregulation. And while there are some unique aspects of it, the fact that, uh, that the state is, is treating it uh, just as any other food product um, would seem to mean that, that they have kind of cleared a mental hurdle on this issue. I, I think they have. And if you look at the regulations that are applicable to kitchens, industrial kitchens, you'll see that there are a lot of ap- uh, regulations applicable to that. If you look at the uh, at regulations that are applicable to agricultural production of beets, you're going to see that there are a lot of regulations uh, about that. Pharmacies, tons of regulations about that. So it's not that these regulations are, wow, this is just completely out of the blue. Uh, they they make sense, unlike what the city of Las Vegas is doing. I'm, I'm looking through there. There's nothing that leaps out at me and says, wow, that, that doesn't make sense. What do you mean? You can't wear sunglasses, and if you have a condition that you, you need sunglasses to wear for, you mentioned glaucoma, you're going to need to wear sunglasses. Maybe people need are, are sensitive to light. Um, Las Vegas is pretty hot, and the sun beats down pretty hard. I can't imagine most people walking around in the summer without hats. So what, are you supposed to strip down naked when you walk into a Las Vegas dispensary? No, no, you do that when you go to McCarran Airport and pass through the TSA checkpoint. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, i got a workaround for that. I'll tell you that off the air. <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, it, it's uh, generally uh, I'm okay with, with the regulations. I think they strike the right tone of what it is we're trying to do here. And do you feel the same about the Clark County regulations? Clark County, uh, you know, no, uh, no I, let me put it this way. Uh, no, I think that I'm, I'm really deeply concerned about the Clark County process because it tends to, my, my belief is that it's kind of front-running the uh, state process uh, and may be uh, designed to do so in order to avoid having its applicants uh, be truly subject to the merit-based process. Now, the state still has to approve the application. Uh, and then the question is, is will the state, if they see a patently inadequate applicant with a special use permit, will they deny the application? That uh, has yet to be determined, and certainly the uh, input into the state agency, the uh, Department of Public Health Medical Cannabis Division, uh, is helpful, as well as the state legislatures, legislators, I should say. So that's kind of where we're at with that. Well, you know, I, and I, I agree with what you're saying that the county is trying to front load, and I think that's partly uh, why we are moving forward at such a breakneck pace. The state is moving forward because they want to have their window open before the county can front load, and the county is saying, oh, no, no, we're going to get this out first. And so it, it's, it's a race which is ultimately uh, for patients, meaning that, that these facilities will be open sooner rather than later. Yes. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Okay, now uh, let, let me ask if, if people want to get a hold of you uh, to consult with you or, or – uh, ask you about these issues. I know uh, some of the people who listen to this show are potential applicants. How will they reach you, Mark? Well, I'm located in Oakland, and uh, I have a office phone number of 510-689-0140, and all they have to do is they mention that they heard me on your show, and I'll uh, give them a call back, and we can discuss uh, what they want to do with respect to engaging this process. Uh, those people who are interested in seeking uh, registrations or applications. Okay, so we've got about 60 seconds, and let me ask you then why somebody should use an Oakland lawyer, an out-of-state lawyer, on on these issues rather than somebody here in Nevada. Well, that's an excellent question. And one, if you're using me, you're actually going to be using a lawyer in Nevada because uh, I have teamed up with uh, a series of lawyers uh, in Nevada to accomplish the objectives of any retention. And why me particularly? Uh, experience and a track record. There you go. And that's where we're going to wrap it up. So, Mark, uh, it's been uh, a pleasure having you on. Uh, You provide a lot of knowledge, and uh, we're going to see you on Friday. Uh, Everybody who's interested, register at wecan702.org slash symposium and come on down Friday and and listen to Mark and Ariel and uh, a host of other experts on this show, uh, on this issue. And until we see you next week, keep fighting for your rights. And remember, together we can do it.